Okay, uh, again, I want to welcome the priests that are visiting with us uh, from various areas of the country in the south. Thanks for joining us. We've had a really good day of meetings. Uh, we've had some quality time with Father Stephen. We were at the Norton Art Gallery. Lewis and Ruth uh, allowed us to meet there again this year, which is a, a beautiful place to meet. And uh, we take breaks and get to see the art and the other things in the museum itself. So very thankful for their hospitality. Thanks to all of you that cooked, that sang, that put everything together. Um, one of the main things we want to show our guests all the time is hospitality, as we're shown all over the Diocese of the South. So if I'm always thankful when we get a, a chance to reciprocate and give back to those that are visiting with us. Father Stephen, it's been a blessing being with you. Thank you so much for the work that you do for the church, for your glory to God, for all things blog, uh, the other books that you've written. May God continue to bless you and your endeavors as you seek to write more and blog more and discuss various things that are relevant as we were talking about today to the culture we live in. Sometimes um, Orthodox are accused of being not relevant, <laughs> not concerned about the culture. Well, we are. We just, we, we try to seek wisdom in how to engage it. We don't uh, adapt to the culture. We try to understand the culture around us and how the ancient Christian faith is still relevant today and we bring it to the culture as it is. But anyway, Father Stephen is, a, I think, a, a leader in that for us uh, through his blogging and other things that he does. So Father Stephen, without further ado, welcome again and thank you so much for your time. We look forward to your presentation this evening. It is a joy to be here. <laughs> suddenly becoming short it's just been the story of my life um, anyway. possible father give us tones let's sing oh heavenly king I could use a little <laughs> good being with you last night. I mentioned then that if you see me fiddling off and on with glasses, it's because I just recently, this last month, had cataract surgery, and I'm trying to get used to the fact that I can see. And uh, I can see you well without my glasses, but I can't see this uh, unless I put them on. And that's just the opposite of where I was a month ago. I had to put on glasses to see your face and take them off to see a text. So, um, I don't know. They said this is an improvement. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just strange, and, uh, but I'll, maybe I'll do this, I can kind of, something. Eventually, I, you know, I think I've bought about a half a dozen pair of reading glasses trying to find out which one works, and, uh, but since you can get them for about five for a dollar, it's worked out well. Last night we talked about uh, uh, the notions of heaven and hell, our understanding of that, and some ways of looking at that in terms of uh, orthodox understanding, understanding in the fathers, and uh, I've talked with a few of you who seem to have found it helpful, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I, you know, talking with uh, Father Jason uh, some weeks back, we were planning on this visit, uh, and I said, well, topics, what do we do? And, and uh, you know, he'd say, the first we said, well, talk about heaven and hell, and I said, we're going to do the second talk, and he said, well, talk about 
atonement and salvation. And I thought, okay. So, you know, and those are broad enough that you can do anything with them. And so it's just what I did last night was anything. And, uh, but uh, I'm, tonight it'll help us think a little bit about the atonement uh, and notions of salvation. Uh, but you'll notice, those of you who were here last night, that there's an awful lot of overlap. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is that all of orthodoxy overlaps because all of, all of orthodoxy is really only one thing. It, it just is that. It is really essentially all about union with God, being united with God, understanding that sin is a breaking of communion with God. We, I don't like that. Actually, I was once told that, that hell was separation from God, but since it says in Psalm 139, Lo, if I descended to hell, thou art there, it doesn't mean that kind of separation. But there is a kind of separation. Imagine yourself in a bad marriage. Maybe some of you have been through those kinds of things and don't have to imagine too much. Uh, maybe you're struggling with that sort of thing. It's possible to be married for, to someone for a good while and yet find yourself in a strained and broken relationship. Um, and you might be together, but you're not together. There's no union. There is a separation and a, a distance that's there. And frankly, um, it's, it, it's worse than just being together. I mean, if it was just being together, it wouldn't be so bad. But it's being together and not wanting to be. And, and that's the really, really hard part of it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like how you imagine your teenager feels about you. But, uh, sorry. Anyway. Um, Maybe you all have wonderful families, but there's a certain thing. I, I, uh, when I was 17 years old and graduated high school, earlier in that year, this was, I graduated in 1971, and so I was deeply influenced by the 1960s. And I'd become a Jesus freak in high school, and uh, anyway, announced in my senior year to my parents that I wasn't going to college, which is not the way my family expected anything to go, but announced I wasn't going to go to college, and uh, my dad said to me, uh, well, fine, uh, get a job and get out. And, uh, and I've been working ever since. I did get out and, and did get a job. I did eventually go to college a couple of years later, um, but it was amazed after about the time, you know, I had finished college to discover how much my father had learned in the past six years. And, uh, Amazingly how wise he got, but it's possible to be with somebody and be deeply, deeply separated. The word atonement is an English word uh, that is a made-up word. Uh, it literally is a made-up word of at one meant. Uh, we didn't have an English word for making two things one. It's interesting to me that today uh, when you say, you know, you need to atone for that, that it doesn't mean at one for that. Uh, in our culture, if I say that someone needs to atone for something, it puts us back in that legal model that I talked about last night. Basically, I mean, you need to pay for this. Is that, uh, let's say, you broke my window because you were stupid. <laughs> something like, you know, not just accidentally, but you were doing, you know, and you say, I'm going to offer to pay for that window, and that's kind of nice, but then I might add to it, I want you to atone for it, so I want you to pay for the window, and I want you to suffer some, and, um, you know, that's sort of what we mean by atonement. When the church, and originally in English, when the word uh, atonement is invented, it, it reflects much more the teaching and doctrine of the church. The question is, uh, how do I become restored to true communion with God? Uh, for orthodoxy, this is what salvation means. Salvation means true union with God. Now, not a union in which we somehow disappear, uh, like you would say, have some sort of notion in Hinduism, you know, that you're kind of just sort of disappearing into the oversoul or Atman or something like that, and your, dis your personality disappears. Uh, instead, it's union, like we talk about the union in the life of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, and yet the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, neither are the Spirit, the Spirit's neither them. It is, there is a union. Interestingly, when people get married, uh, in the Western world, 
uh, marriage has been turned into a legal model, like I'm talking about legal models last night, so that it's about a contract. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Notice, lawfully wedded wife. There it is. Do you take this one to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you, you know, promise to da 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 da? You know, I do, and da 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 da, and she does, and that's what that is. You, uh, and you go then to an Orthodox wedding, and you notice there are no vows. There are no vows, no promises made in an Orthodox wedding. Now, I've always explained this to people that it means for Orthodox on our wedding days, we don't have to perjure ourselves, but um, they <laughs> make a lot of promises that we're going to break pretty soon. But anyway, um, you know, it's, it's what's going on? It's, it's, you know, we talk about the union of husband and wife. So we bring two people into the church in orthodoxy. We put them in the middle of the church. We pray, pray, pray around them. We incense a little bit. We pray some more. We make them drink some wine. And we tie them up. And then we walk them in a circle around uh, the, the mystery table three times. And if they're not too dizzy, we finish, you know, we untie them and, you know, and off they go. Uh, and they're married. Um, and I mean, there is in the Russian version of the service, the priest asks, you know, are you here of your own free will? You know, like that your daddy hasn't drug you in here, but are you, or your father-in-law-to-be hasn't drug you in here. <laughs> East Tennessee, that's a real issue. But um, <laughs> East Tennessee, Kentucky, they need to answer questions like, is this your cousin? <laughs> or not. I tell people, I mean, I, 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 I was saying yesterday to somebody that I really, really, really am a native redneck. I, I grew up in a true, my daddy was an auto mechanic, my mama worked in a sewing room. Uh, I'm from the hills of South Carolina. And uh, the, uh, I'm told that my mother, my parents became Orthodox at age 79 at Father Marcus's church. And I'm told my mother's first Pascha, they said, Christ has risen. And my mother said, and I sure am glad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've always told them myself that the, the way you could really tell that I was actually born a redneck was that the first girl I ever kissed was a cousin at a family reunion. <laughs> and um, I, I liked her. And my mother, I asked my mother when I got home, was that, you know, because I knew she wasn't a first cousin. I wouldn't have kissed a first cousin. I knew better. But she's just a relative. And turns out she was third cousin, which is legal in South Carolina. But uh, it did not work out, though she is married to one of my other first cousins. So we kept that in the family. The, uh, but in orthodoxy, it is about this union. It's the union of husband and wife. The union of a man and a woman uh, in the sacrament of marriage. They become one, we say, and the two become one flesh. Now, the literal fulfillment of one flesh in a marriage are children. They are bone of my bone, bone of her bone, flesh of my flesh, flesh of her flesh. They're me and her. They are our union. But we also believe that not only are the children th that union, they are a visible uh, kind of sacramental expression of the union of a man and a woman. But that union also has a true, true with a capital T and real union. A husband. St. Silouan said of the monastics in um, Amenathos, my brother is my life. My wife is my life. She is my other self. St. Paul says no man ever yet hated his own flesh and says your wife is your flesh. So this is, in some ways, this, this image of union of husband and wife. Jesus and St. Paul, they use this expression to talk about the nature of our union, the union of the church with Christ. The, the church is the bride of Christ, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You know, we look forward towards the marriage supper of the Lamb. We eat the marriage supper of the Lamb at every Eucharist. This is that meal. It is the meal that is to come 
being made present among us now, a true meal of union with God. When we baptize you in uh, to the life of Christ, the key question asked in the ancient form of baptism in the Orthodox Church is, do you unite yourself to Christ? I do unite myself to Christ. Do you unite yourself to Christ? I do unite myself to Christ. Do, third time, do you? And then, have you united yourself to Christ? And by the end, you're ready to say, I already have. Give me a break, you know? You know, and, and then they do some more things. And then again, they ask you one more time, have you united yourself with Christ? Now, I, I sometimes use these as teaching moments when I have visitors, which often is the case, visiting in an Orthodox church to watch a baby get baptized. And so I'll stop and just tell the Baptists, because that's who's visiting, uh, explain to them that this is the Orthodox equivalent of do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, only it's expressed in the actual language of Scripture. As many as are baptized into Christ are united. We are baptized into his death. The death of Jesus becomes my death. I had this so profoundly brought home to me in my first year as an Orthodox Christian. My wife and family and I were received on the 15th of February, 1998, Feast of the Prodigal Son. That's got its own wonderful stories about it. But on Pascha of that year, a fellow Episcopal priest who was converting along with his wife, they were received at Pascha. And on bright Wednesday of that week, his wife was killed on a car wreck. And suddenly, our brand new little mission in a warehouse in Knoxville, Tennessee, was plunged into a level of grief that nobody wants to have in their life. And certainly a church knew you got, you know, 15 people in a congregation. You just, it totally, you know, and they, they were very, very close friends of mine. And, and uh, needless to say, and, and suddenly it sort of plunged my friend into a kind of limbo because you're an Orthodox priest. You get one marriage. You don't get two. And he just had his one. And so I was being received and trained to be ordained as an Orthodox priest. He not only lost his wife, he lost his priesthood. And unless he wanted to be a monk, he lost any future he had. He, in fact, later remarried and is one of my laymen and just a fantastic guy. That's a long part of that story. But I remember the way the timing on things worked. We called and, I mean, uh, it was agony for me because I was no longer an Episcopal priest. I couldn't do what a priest does. All of my instincts... Useless. I, mean, I can be a friend, but I couldn't be a priest. And you need a priest when your wife gets killed. And so Father Peter Smith, who was our dean, came up from Columbia and spent the latter part of the week. And the Greek priest in our town was extremely kind to us and, and sit, called and assisted. He said, you must do the funeral here at the Greek church. We weren't going to, I mean, you can do it in a warehouse. So I would do that. But the timing of things worked out such that on Bright Friday... We were standing by her uh, coffin and doing by her coffin what the previous Friday we had been doing at the Epitaphius, the burial shroud of Christ. And so it went. We did this way because the, the uh, funeral of, in the Orthodox Church is patterned after uh, and modeled on the, the matins services surrounding the burial of Christ. And so, of course, when we finished at the grave, we began to sing, Christ is risen from the dead. And, you know, it was, it was so completely clear to us, her union with Christ, her death united to Christ, and the promise of his resurrection and her life as well. It, it just, it was, it was eerie, eerie good, but it was eerie. Um, you know, when it, you, you go around the church uh, with the procession, with the shroud, and, and one common tradition in orthodoxy is you come in and the shroud is held up and everybody goes under the shroud to come back into the church. It's another liturgical baptism going through the death of Christ into uh, the life of the church. This is, this is who we are. Um, and um, it is union. 
It is union. I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the right way to understand, if you have to put it, pin one thing to talk about the Orthodox faith, is that the Orthodox faith is about union with Christ. Everything in it, all of the sacraments are about union. Baptism, union with his death and resurrection. Chrismation, union with him in the Holy Spirit. Communion, whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. It's union in Christ. And, and on we go, and on we go. All of this, this life. And this, this life we live in the church is also the right life to live as human beings. Yep. One of the things that's happened to us in our modern culture is fragmentation. We are uh, in our own minds. We were talking about this this morning and one of the things I was doing with, with priests. A fragmentation occurred in Christianity at the time of the Reformation. Um, there was a rebellion against the medieval consensus of the Catholic Church that marked medieval Western Europe. There was a rebellion against that and the notion that that, that sacramental tradition of, uh, of medieval Catholicism should be replaced with a new tradition. And in that sense, they understood things, that you've got to have something. And so the new touchstone is to be the scripture. And so you have the battle cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Uh, but one of the things that happens is Luther says sola scriptura, Calvin says sola scriptura, Zwingli says sola scriptura, Busser says sola scriptura, and they cannot agree on what that means. A fragmentation occurred immediately. There, I've said that there actually it's incorrect to talk about Protestantism. You should only be able to say Protestantisms because there isn't the one. There has never been a one, it began as a many. And not only did it begin as a many, it has within it, and it's, it's a book I have been enjoying lately called The Unintended Reformation, because none of them meant to do that. This was not Luther's intention. It was not Calvin's intention, but they did it anyway. There's a fragmentation that takes place, and even almost a spirit of fragmentation that has happened such that we live in a world today that not only are we separated from each other into notions of I'm an individual and radical individualism, that my life is my own, and even the worst parts of it, that not only is my life my own, but it's mine to do with as I want. You know, we have that terrible blasphemy in our culture in which a woman can say, this is my body as a way to justify the death of the infant she carries. The very words of Christ himself, this is my body that I give you, sort of a symbol of our culture, this is my body, it belongs to me. You may not have it. Christ, the giver of life, eat my body. We, the takers of life, you may not have my body. It's my body, very tragic sort of thing. But in our culture, we've moved not only to a fragmentation between each other, but in fact, a fragmentation inside ourselves. We, um, there is a, um, a kind of, uh, I mean, Alistair McIntyre, a great Catholic philosopher and writer, uh, said that, um, that even in like a single uh, Supreme Court decision, which is a carefully reasoned sort of thing since you know you're actually setting a precedent and people are going to do it like that, that in a single paragraph of a Supreme Court decision, there are likely to be three or four uh, mutually exclusive, contradictory, philosophical groundworks supporting it. In other words, it's just inconsistent. He, he has a book called Whose Justice, Which Rationality, as in you know, we can't say it's based on reason because we don't even agree what reason is or what the principles of reason are. I, I, I mentioned this morning that we've crossed a boundary now that we've, uh, in various ways, such that the disagreement has become great enough and we've had introduced into our culture uh, the sort of worst uh, fruit of this that we can have, and that is the recognition by some that the only way they can achieve unity is violence and coercion. 
The nature, for instance, of politically correct speech is about violence and coercion. Now, it's being said because the culture was being violent and coercive to us, so we're going to be violent and coercive back. I, I got a taste of this in 1989 when I was in uh, grad school at Duke, and it, Duke was sort of a, on a leading edge of Marxism in the South, kind of like Vanderbilt where your daughters study them. You know, <laughs> be careful, Father. But anyway, I, I'm at Duke, and, and I was in, uh, a, uh, in a graduate seminar, and one of the women in the graduate seminar was a radical lesbian feminist, and uh, I knew that, but I just couldn't quite get it through my head about how I ought to behave. And we didn't have any rules of political speech in the uh, graduate school of religion in the department of uh, uh, the divinity school they did. And you know, for instance, the divinity school, you had to use inclusive language with regard to God, or you couldn't turn your paper in. But we were allowed to get away with it in the graduate school of religion. But I was in a seminar one day, and we're in the middle of a debate, and I said something pretty sharp to my lady friend, and I ended it with, dear, so-and-so and so-and-so, dear, and she brought charges against me <laughs> in the school. And as it turned out, if I'd been in the, the uh, divinity school, I would have been suspended for that. But I remember just saying to her, I said, you know, you think that's bad? I mean, look, I served, at that time, I was also working part-time as a priest in an Episcopal church. I said, I call ladies there dear all the time. I call my mama dear. You know, and I'm sorry that it offended you, but how was I to know? If I'd have known, I'd have called her something else. But anyway, you know, I don't know if the shoe fits, but, um, you know, but the, what happens today is the only way I can make you agree is to do just that, to make you agree. You know, the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. Especially, it's very interesting not to read the tail end of the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s as things were unwinding, but to read it up uh, in the 1920s as it was just gearing up. It was radically crazy. They tried to overhaul the family, and it began to fall apart. But uh, I've strayed too far. I'll bring us back. Our atonement, though, I want us to think about at one to be in union with God. How does he do that? Well, I noticed, I've sort of, preparing for the talk, I, was, I sort of went on my website, and, I mean, my blog, and typed in salvation, atonement and salvation. And I came up, you know, a bunch of, you know, articles appear, and trying to see what I said about things. The only problem about writing a lot is you, you know, the, the universal way of finding out anything is to Google it. I can't tell you how frustrating it is to want to find out something and Google it and only get what you wrote. You know, and I think, no, 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 I know that, but, you know. But anyway, there's some titles. Uh, the Way of Shame in Salvation. A Cosmic Salvation. The Material Aspect of Our Salvation. Our Conciliar Salvation. Communion as Salvation. Beauty and Salvation. Salvation and a cloud of witnesses. And that's just sort of the top ones that came up. And I thought, well, you know, salvation actually is everything. I mean, everything we do in the church is for salvation. Every doctrine the church teaches is and only is for salvation. We, we, that is what God has given us, is that which is for our salvation. And if it is that which is for our salvation, it is that which is for our union, restoring our union with God through Christ in the Holy Spirit. Um, the, uh, I talked about this a little last night in talking about the legal imagery. I grew up in the Bible Belt uh, in South Carolina uh, in a Baptist church and heard a very legal account of salvation as in I had sinned and was deserving of hell and if I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, uh, then I could be saved. And of course, since I was a Baptist, they also baptized you, but they didn't think it mattered. I mean, they were careful to explain for some reason that we want you to do this, but you need to understand that nothing happens. That we're doing this as an ordinance, it's an obedience to a command of Christ, but nothing happens. So that's kind of interesting. It's just like communion. This is grape juice and soda crackers but nothing happens. You eat it and think about it. 
And that's what it's for. Do this in remembrance of me so y'all remember him and eat this, drink this. And that's sort of what it is. It is a world without sacrament. There is a name for this, and I'm, so I'm going to get, uh, get a little philosophical with you for a few minutes. There is a name for a philosophy that everyone born in our country is born with, and even if they've never studied philosophy. Okay? It's called nominalism. Okay. Nominalism, it's based on the Latin word nomen, that means name, and it is a belief that when you talk about something, your words are words. They're not the something. You know, that for instance, when I say love, the word love is an idea, but it's not referring to a thing that's love. Um, and in fact, I mean, there, you can trace the history of this. It begins in the 1200s with William of Ockham, and there's other major medieval philosophers. Interestingly enough, in the Middle Ages, in the West, there were three major branches of Christian theological thinking. One was called, I mean, it was Platonic philosophy, which had been much more the way of the Eastern Church. Then there was the new stuff uh, that was uh, Thomist, uh, following St. Thomas, that was based on Aristotle. And then there was the third thing that, interestingly enough, was called the Via Moderna, the modern way. And it really went on to become the modern way. And there's a lot of interesting, that's a very complex story, it's not a straight line, but a very complex story, such that we think that thinking is the thing. What do you think about that? You know? We, the subject came up earlier today about believing. When you and I think about believing, we think about a, th a thought. You know, do you believe in Jesus Christ essentially is asking somebody a propositional question. Do you believe in the proposition that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Christ, the Messiah of God? That's what we mean by that. And do, do you give mental assent to that? That's nominalism. It's not actually what faith means in the primitive teaching of the church, which is news to people. You know, I mean, sometimes I've kind of gotten snappy about these things. People ask me, do you believe in Jesus Christ? I say, believe in him. I eat him. You know? <laughs> it was like someone, someone asked, I can't remember who it was. It might have been. Oh, any one of those great snappy English writers asked him, did he believe in infant baptism? He said, believe in it? I've actually seen it. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> but that's sort of the way the intellectual proposition about these things. And I might add, it's one of the things that throws us into constant doubt. It's like, what am I thinking about God today? You know what? you might have a bad day. And you might not be thinking very good about anything. What does that have to do with you and God? You know, that might have to do with what you ate for breakfast or didn't eat for breakfast or the coffee you ain't had yet. You know, I mean, what do I think about it? I, I've been married 40 years now. I don't think about it. It's much more useful not to think about it. <laughs> I mean, I do not get up in the morning and think about my relationship with my wife. I mean, I mean, if she wants to talk about our relationship, I just know we're in trouble. I mean, we're, we're at the point, actually we're at the point now where we have these conversations in which I say, you remember him? And can you believe that? And just say, yes. And, and that, pa that passed for a conversation. With, <laughs> You know, that just the tone of my voice and she'll know who I meant. You know, that's the kind of 40 years just adds up that way. And, but it's, you know, do I think about it? Some days we get along and some days we don't. Because some days I'm in a bad mood. She's never in a bad mood. It's me, my fault. I know this always. But always. And, and it doesn't do me any good to plead otherwise. <laughs> so... I tell young men when we're getting, preparing them for their wedding that actually the elder Zacharias told me this over in Essex. He said the most important thing that a young man can 
learn are the two words, yes, ma'am, <laughs> or yes, dear. You know? <laughs> so I tell young men this, if you learn that, I say, I'm a priest. I obey my bishop. I obey my parish council. I obey my wife. Why would I want to do what I want to do? I mean, what good is that? You know? What do you want for supper? Sweetie, what do I want? I don't know. Um, so, but union, union with Christ, uh, I wrote about a material union with Christ. We, our nominalism can think that all that matters is in a sacrament is what you're thinking about it. That the baptism is only because you made a promise. And it's about this idea exchange that you had with Jesus. We tend to not think the water does anything. In orthodoxy, it does. You know, it crushes the heads of the dragons. We pray that it becomes the waters of the Jordan. The strange experience is to stand by the River Jordan and listen to the bishop do. Uh, Father Marcus and I have been there together, listen to a bishop do the prayer for the blessing of the waters, praying and asking God to make the Jordan be the Jordan. And, uh, but it's a supernatural Jordan that becomes present and you know, flows through the fonts of our churches. Uh, and it's real. It's really strange considering you and I have never had an immaterial experience generally in our life. Okay? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a pretty strong Christian materialist, more than a lot of people uh, like to be. A lot of people have still got a lot of nominalism running out in their head. But, you know, when you have a thought, it has a chemical and, ele and electrical component. You don't have thoughts without them. It's, you are a thinking, you're thinking material. I mean, I think the thing that bothers people is that material can think. Strange, they want to think computers can do that, but they don't want to think you can do that. You think that way. People come to me, you know, as they will with a priest and say, I'm suffering from depression. I want to find out first, how are you eating? What's your exercise like? And you've been talking to your doctor yet. And, this, and I'll get this thing and they say, well, I, I just think it's a spiritual problem. And I'm thinking, what is it about diet and exercise that you think is not spiritual? Uh, there's a phrase in Timothy where he says, uh, bodily ex in King James says, bodily exercise profiteth little, which makes it sound like it ain't no good. But actually what it really means in the Greek is that it will do you some good. Uh, Timothy was having stomach problems and Paul is writing him letters and he told him to drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and to get a little exercise. Imagine that. Paul said, you know, work out and drink. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Timothy said, amen. But <laughs> and I think it was Titus who was in Cyprus and he told them that the, the, it was in Crete, he told them that the Cretans are slow bellies and liars. And I think, what a terrible thing to have in scripture said about your people. But, um, what was it, Timothy? Who was it? He writes that too. Slow bellies and liars. I don't know what a slow belly is, but I sure like that word. You slow belly. Um, but, you know, we, God comes to us, and strangely enough, how does He unite Himself with us? He becomes a man. Flesh and bone and blood. Thinking with cells. All that we know of to be flesh and blood. He becomes that. This is God's notion of how you begin an atonement. And so, and then he invites us into the same thing. We do what? Plunges us in water. That we unite with him. Bathe this flesh and blood in water that's now become the supernatural Jordan. I'm born again. Filled with the Holy Spirit. United with him. Married to Christ so that I am bone of his bone and flesh of of his flesh and then he tells me eat my flesh drink my blood if you eat my flesh and drink my blood I abide in you and by you know and you abide in me whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood I mean that it cleanses us from sin this is the as Saint Ignatius said it's the medicine of immortality you know God gave us very very practical things and of course if you're orthodox he also gave us exercises to do you know prostrations and uh, 
you know, in, in Lent, lots of them. Um, uh, we were talking about this today in confession, that it, you know, what happens when I'm not believing and I'm struggling with the thoughts? Well, the answers the fathers would give uh, is that you're to, to pay some atten more attention to your body. Uh, Evagrius Ponticus wrote and said that the soul will do what the body does. You know, if you need to humble the soul, humble the body. It's sort of why we fast, is the humbling of the body. Prostrations are the humbling of the body. A lot of uh, directions, I know one prayer rule that I've used at one point, starts with prostrations. And it basically do prostrations till you get your mind right, so you can pray. And there's some mornings that I kind of go in and do my prostration, and because I'm old, yeah. Uh, it's a long prostration. And I kind of stay down there till I get my mind right, and then I get up. It takes a long time some mornings. But uh, my father, along with my mother, came into the church at age 79, and he called me up and Lent that year down at St. John of the Ladder. It's third Sunday of Lent. said, son, they brought out the cross today. I said, yes. He said, well, I wanted to get down, so I did. But they had to get me back up. So. <laughs> But, you know, and you know him, he was a man who wept so freely, you know, and to know, I wish I could have watched my father on his hands and knees before the cross, because I know he would not only have been on his hands and knees, but have been weeping as he did it, and weeping, no doubt, as they helped him get back up. You know, humble your body. This, he, he wants to unite us with him, and interestingly, he gives us the sacraments that are sacraments of atonement. Uh, constantly uniting us with him. You know, if you're struggling in your life, people say, I'm sorry I haven't been to church lately. I've been struggling. I'm thinking, what the heck are you doing? That's like saying I was sick, so I didn't go to a hospital. You know? If people, I've just been having a struggle, so I didn't take communion. I think, what do you think communion is for? This is like, eat, you're going to eat and drink eternal life, but you're going to wait till you get better first? No, no, no. Eat and drink. Archbishop Dimitri said, always remind them that communion is also for the forgiveness of sins. You know, I tell people, if you think you, don't, you shouldn't take communion, then you should go to confession and say to the priest, I don't think I should take communion, and let him tell you whether or not you should. You know, that's like, it's like deciding that to write your own prescriptions. You know, sometimes when you're sick, you're also crazy. And... <laughs> You know, and particularly if you're spiritually sick, you don't know what you need. You, you, you know, you might need somebody to say, no, 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 I think, I mean, I can't, I've almost, I can't ever think of telling somebody, no, I think you shouldn't take communion. I mean, I, well, actually, I, a couple of times, but, you know, not proactively. Whether it came and I thought, no, I mean, you might not, you might not ought to. You need to, we need to work on getting that right before you come to the cup. But, it, but generally speaking, we need to. It is atonement. It is at one minute. We find union with God in the cup. Grace on a spoon. Now, I also like to think about communion and grace on the spoon because if it actually depended on you thinking, you, on, you would forget it on the way to the cup. The communion, that, that sweet thought you had as you're standing in line and then there's that kid acting up and then there's the choir singing off key and then the line's long and you wonder how long it's going to be before the bishop gives you a deacon and other kinds of things like that so that your communion doesn't take so long and by the time you get to the cup you've forgotten thank god it goes in your mouth and not in your brain you know that i get my communion whether i'm thinking nice about it or not but we we in our culture have turned ourselves into a culture of ideas. And we think about atonement uh, as a, a set of ideas that Christ died for me back then. I accept that as an historical event and ask God to forgive me of my sins. Well, it is an historical event, but it is constantly present with us. Christ crucified. Paul says, I've determined to know and to preach among you only Christ crucified. 
He, he is always with us, crucified. We eat his body and drink his blood. You've got to crucify him to get it. You know, we do not believe in a re-sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We say uh, that the one sacrifice of Christ on Calvary is the one sacrifice that is made present on the altar. That this is Golgotha. You know, it is, this is God's footstool. This is Golgotha. We come, you know, we, we stand near this incredible mystery. He gives himself to us as physical beings. This is the strange insanity of our modern culture, that we are strangely materialist on one hand and yet Gnostics on the other. That we, you know, we do the strangest things about our bodies and are addicted to porn, although even porn is kind of typical of us. It's not, you know, it's an image on a screen. <laughs> it's not like you're chasing women. You're just looking at pixels and uh, you don't even know if it's real. It's just pixels. You're addicted to pixels. Um, it's so strange. And, you know, but God calls us to a true physical union. I, I think it's actually one of the blessings to us because you, even though we're crazy and we're caught up in ideas, you can't help but be physical because you are. You know, I had a priest I was working with doing spiritual direction and he said, Father, I want to work on being present. I know what he meant, but I said, you know what? You can't help it. Here you are. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, I, I know what he means, you know, and I think part of it is, is that what's happening is that you are actually privileging your wandering mind and you think that's you. Uh, as, a, as a man with ADD, I've had to learn to not privilege my mind because I can almost never be present. Say at, at any given moment, I have the thoughts of five men in my head. That's just how it is, you know, and they don't always agree. But my body's here. My body's here. I do that on Sundays when I pray and get ready to go on the altar in the church. I just think, come on, guys, let's go in. You know? <laughs> Which one of you is preaching today? <laughs> my son, who also has ADD, is in my congregation, and he has a little hand signal for me when the rabbit trails have started up. He just goes. <laughs> And I'm so afraid the congregation is going to catch on, you know, and so some Sunday I'm going to be there and everybody's going to go, you know. <laughs> and I'll just, yeah. <laughs> sorry, but um, I don't know. He says he likes the rabbit trails, but I don't know. It, it works. It's easier blogging because I can limit the trails. Um, but I write about 10 articles for every one that actually manages to get on the paper. It's like, no, no, don't do that one. What, what about? But what about an article on squirrels, you know? So anyway, the, um, our union with God, I mean, we're blessed. We have a body. You can't be somewhere else. You know, one of the things to do is learn how to be in your body. Quit thinking so much. Learn to be in your body. And, you know, do things. That's why you pray as an Orthodox Christian. You cross yourself. Why? Because it's not just in your head. You know, there are many, many times I have no words to say to God. I speak with my hands. I use sign language. It's a sign of the cross. God understands. And, and the devil does too. And he flees. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those who hate him flee from before his face. And those who make the sign of the cross. This is, you know, this is our prayer. We make prostrations. I light a candle. This is a physical church for physical people because you just are. One of the dangers that's happened in our post-Reformation culture is that Christianity has been turned into an audience. And, which means listeners. And so it's uh, ideas speaking to ideas. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get the distinct impression that, you know, sermons are nice, but in orthodoxy, they're not big deals. I mean, I like to think they are, but, but they're not. Um, I sometimes think that if I left it off one Sunday, people might say later, 
was there a sermon today? Did I miss that? You know, or actually, they would probably not bring it up. You know, <laughs> Shh, don't tell him. <laughs> he might do it. <laughs> but the, you know, you come. You light the candles. You pray. You cross yourself. You make prostrations. You chase your children. You do whatever. Your children chase you. They chase each other. It, we, we are here. We are here. I hate that. I'm thinking about you. <laughs> you know, um, don't think about me. You know, uh, come see me, touch me, hug me, give me food. Uh, these are, and we, we are human beings and uh, created with bodies. And so our salvation, our atonement, is a, a union with Christ. And so when we do orthodox theology about salvation, we have to do it in harmony with the language of union. In harmony, even our physical union with God, uh, which is also our spiritual union with God. And when we talk about, I have to say, when we talk about physical uh, things, that in a post-Reformation society, people think that means superstition. That's, that's the, the post-Reformation term for anything physical that's religious, is it's superstitious. And I think, well, that's just really interesting because those thoughts you have in your mind, of course, can't be superstitious. They're spiritual. And, uh, because we have the idea that spiritual means not material and my thoughts are not material. They're just sort of out there in the ether, kind of floating around, you know, kind of grooving on things. Like all of America's become California. And uh, instead, instead, you know, even your thoughts are physical. Even your thoughts are physical. We are physical beings. You're not an angel. You're not an angel. Quit thinking that you are. You're not an angel. You have a body. Get back in your body. You know. I always say, get out of your mind. Come to your senses. Uh, okay. Get out of your mind. Come to your senses. The Orthodox Church. Uh, it, a highly sensual church in the right meaning of the word. Um, God created us for union with him. We do not teach as Orthodox Christians that God had any need. God is without needs. He's God. He can't need anything. You cannot say God must anything. It just, that, that sentence doesn't fly. Okay? God, you can't say God must. God is. God loves. You don't say God must anything. He created us for union with him. Those who say that Christ had to die on the cross to appease his wrath, God doesn't need appeasing. Or they say the sacrifice does that, and they misunderstand and misinterpret the sacrifices uh, in the Old Testament. There is no teaching anywhere in the Old Testament about any of the sacrifices. And I'm, in this, I'm citing the authority of Father uh, Patrick Henry Reardon, who's just done a recent book on the atonement. There is no Old Testament sacrifice that says anything about dealing with the wrath of God. By and large, dealing with the wrath of God is all about repentance in the Old Testament, not about sacrifices. Not about sacrifices. God's Son is not offered up to make the Father happy. God's Son is not offered up to reconcile the Father to us. God sent His only Son to reconcile us to Him. This is, there's only one action. The single action of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God sent His only Son into the world uh, and the Son says, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He, he is the express will of the Father in His actions for us. So when we talk about His atoning, see, His atoning death on the cross, it's His at one death on the cross. So what's He at one -ing? Well, He's trying to at one a bunch of dead people. Okay? I have written and said, so the nicest quote I've ever gotten, and I've tried to claim it and copyright it, but that, that, that Christ did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. Okay? He did not come, I mean, it does happen to be that it will turn us from bad to good, but it's not the point. It's dead men 
we're dead. We learned the word Torah last night, right? This, this rotting thing, this disgusting thing. He, he came and enters in. He at ones us by becoming what we are, including dead. He enters into death. And so we speak about this in the church. This, the, language, um, the language of sacrifice is a very interesting thing. Um, and I have to say that it is, um, you know, a lot of, of kind of typical Christian teaching, Reformation, sometimes Catholic, occasionally I've even heard it out of Orthodox lips when they don't know what they're saying, does some interesting thing about the Old Testament sacrifices and all. It's very difficult to know. I mean, for instance, when we said Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, well, Okay, you, it's an interesting thing to say, actually, because the Passover lamb is not normally thought of as a sacrifice. Yeah? You know, sacrifice, you cut it up and burn it. This one, you cut it up and cook it and eat it. You mark its blood, you know, the Passover, you mark its blood. So it's very interesting to say Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And you didn't even say Christ, our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. It's a very interesting phrase that Paul has there in Corinthians. Uh, Hebrews is the primary New Testament book that will talk about the image of, of that, but he, he does it to talk about how useless the sacrifice of bulls and goats were. And that the, the atoning, the true at one sacrifice is this uh, at one sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But so I say, I think the right way to think about this, and especially as you read, if you listen, listen to the words of the liturgy, listen to the words of the service, and I encourage you, just with orthodox ears, listen for the language of union. It's everywhere. Uh, I, I kind of ran across this uh, when, I, I, in seminary, I had two classes that clashed with each other. One was a class in moral theology that was heavy into the legal stuff, but the other was a class in sin and redemption, so it was dealing with atonement. And I kind of got this cognitive dissonance going on in my head that created a question for me. And the question was, as I was studying doctrines of the atonement, there was one called the classical model, that is uh, Christus Victor. Christ goes into hell to set us free. It's the orthodox model. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. What would it look like if a moral theology were based on that version of the atonement? And I wrote a little paper for that in my senior year in seminary. And got an A. But anyway, um, I thought it was kind of interesting, and I kept thinking about it. So after seminary, starting in my deacon's year, uh, I started a, a work that in, the, in my family became known as The Book. And The Book was Papa's down in his study working on the book, the book was me thinking, because I had to, I had to write to think, and it was me thinking about this, and by the time I finished, I actually finished it, sent it to a publisher or two, and got it sent back, and you need a little rejection in your life, you know, so that, that wasn't there, and I looked at it, now. I mean, if I was look at it now, it wasn't worth publishing, but essentially what I didn't realize then that I had just done was I had just recreated orthodoxy. I mean, I asked the right questions and got the right answers. When I went to Duke, I actually thought, I'm going to take this thing and turn it into my dissertation. I'll work this through. But I got there, and in the first semester, I write a, read a book by uh, Vigan Guarian, uh, Love, what is it? Um, anyway, it was a book on love by Vigan Guarian. And I read it, and I thought, oh, somebody already wrote it. <laughs> I'll have to work on something else. And, you know, you kind of discover that, in fact, this is all just the faith. I was kind of reassured that my thinking was that wasn't that far off. But what happened to me is beginning to think in the key of union. Um, it's amazing if you start reading your scriptures with that in mind. It's everywhere. It is your New Testament. Read the gospel and the letters of John. It'll just honk your nose. It's just everywhere. This language and imagery of union. This is God's atoning, at wanting us uh, with him. So I'm going to possibly give us some time for questions now. Is that okay, Father? Is that good? Okay. Let's, 
It's far away, darlings. And anything's fair game, by the way. So. <coughs> and he left them speechless. <laughs> oh, there's one. Hey, Father. You get in, in Anselm, and he's not the first, he just did it, wrote it big. Uh, a notion, and, and Anselm, it's actually when you really read him, he says this in very medieval terms. <clears throat> I mean, in terms of like feudalism. You know, in feudalism, everybody belongs to somebody. There's the dukes and the earls and the lords, and they belong to the king. The king belongs to God, you know, or pope or somebody. But anyway, everybody belongs to somebody, and it's about honor. It's an honor culture. And he writes, in a way, trying to make the gospel relevant to a feudal society and says, since God's the greatest, <clears throat> uh, Adam and Eve sinned against God's honor. And his honor is offended. And because he's an infinite God, his honor is infinitely offended. And it has to be, like you need to know back then, it, that, uh, that offense needs to be paid for. And so God becomes perfect man, <clears throat> and the perfect man pays the price to restore the honor of God. That's how Anselm wrote it. Now, there's, none of, there's no scripture in that. That's sort of Anselm with a theory. The, <clears throat> as time goes on, I and mean, of course the, the West was increasingly thinking about things in legal terms. I blame it on speaking Latin. Uh, I just think Latin likes laws. It's very good at writing laws. It is not very good at doing philosophy. I don't think it's worth a toot in doing theology. That's also sort of Augustine. He's, he's brilliant. He's amazing. But it's not for doing theology. You need Greeks and Russians to do theology. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, maybe Romanians. But <clears throat> you do. You just do. The, but this notion, especially in, as it develops, and you know, and today, if you're going to put your kid in an evangelical school, you probably have to sign a statement that you believe in the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. They won't mention the creed, but they've got a theory of the atonement that actually is a minor sort of thing. But <coughs> that theory of the atonement is stated in the language of justice, that God's justice is offended infinitely uh, and must be paid for with an infinite payment, that is the payment of Christ's death, his blood shed and presented to the Father. Uh, and, you know, when it's not been atoned for, the wrath of God rests upon the world. And there's, I know all of the wrath verses because I have them quoted to me all the time uh, by the wrath people. And, uh, <laughs> hello, we're here from Calvin and we've brought you some wrath. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unlike the Spanish Inquisition, everybody's expecting the wrath to come from Geneva. But anyway, the, <clears throat> the, what's actually true is that there, I, I love this, in, uh, J. and D. Kelly wrote a class, a great book called, uh, sort of like an introduction to Christian doctrine. It's sort of early, early Christian doctrines. And I mean, it was like a standard seminary book for lots of denominations. We had to have it as Anglicans. And he was an Anglican and he read it through. And it gets to a chapter on the atonement. And he says in it, after having just finished all of these chapters on the, that is nothing but Greek, 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 Greek. That's like the creed, the Christology and all of this sort of stuff. And he suddenly gets to the atonement and said, the East, the Orthodox, the East never developed a theory of the atonement. 
And the first time I read that, and I thought, well, then what does that tell you? Uh, I mean, actually, it tells you something crazy. I mean, that's like saying that the East could never tell someone how Jesus Christ had died for their sins. We had no way of talking about that. I, we had no way of talking about that. Actually, we have a lot of ways of talking about that. It's the only thing we ever talk about. Everything we talk about is that. It is union with God. He just couldn't see it for what it is. In the Christus Victor model, we have been taken captive to sin, the death, the devil. We're held captive. Christ dies, and it's very graphic kind of imagery. He dies, he descends into Hades, he binds the strong man, he smashes the gates. There it is. There it is. The gates are smashed beneath his feet. He's taking Adam by the hand and saying, let's get out of here. Right? This is the atonement. It is the, this is the, the icon we use at Pascha for Christ's resurrection. The resurrection is about going to hell and getting everybody out. Gates of hell are smashed beneath his feet. Um, and you know, some icons of it will have him taking Adam and Eve. Here he's just got Adam by the hand. Maybe, is there anybody? Okay, just Adam. Eve's kind of tagging along there right by Adam, hanging on to him. And, uh, you know, and he's dragging him out. And there's others. That's uh, just behind him is John the Baptist, who showed up there first because he's beheaded. And he goes into Hades to say, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The light is coming. You know, and there's, there's a king standing behind him, probably, who knows, David or someone like that. And there just is all these souls down there. And, uh, and the, some icons of it has, uh, a, this one might make in a very dim shadow, yes, it's a very dim shadow, is, is the demon, is Satan bound in chains underneath the sweet of There's his face, oh my goodness. Yeah. There's keys and parts of things, and there's Satan, you see his face there on the left. He's underneath, he just, he's, this is Christmas tree. This is, let's get out of here. And the church has to come with that way to say it. So we sing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tomb is bestowing life. The, the imagery works. The other, explaining it all by some sort of legal theory, is a real problem. Because, as I explained some last night, if it's just a legal issue, God could have dropped the charges. You know, it becomes, in a sense, you wind up, people will, I've heard people say things, but God's justice demands, and I'm thinking, oh, this is one of those God must statements, isn't it? <laughs> you know, God wants to forgive us, but he can't. He's got this justice issue. And I'm thinking, he's got, you're making sound neurotic, you know? He's got OCD or something, you know? No, they've got to be, you know, punish them. No, 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 no. And this is craziness, but this is taught. It is taught. I deal with atheists all the time in my writings and kind of in my journeys out on the internet and kind of doing that stuff out there. I deal with them all the time and I always say to an atheist, tell me about the God you don't believe in. I'll bet I don't believe in that one either. You know? And oftentimes they believe in the God of the penal substitution. And they, therefore they don't believe in him. Uh, Father Thomas Hopko said sometimes it requires the grace of God to become an atheist. Particularly if you're fleeing a false God. You know? And so when I meet somebody who's an atheist, I just think, dude, 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 I know you're probably really angry and stuff that way. And I just want you to know you got a friend. I I'm not your enemy. I do not think God's trying to send you to hell. You know? Uh, in fact, I probably think you're already there and I've come to bust you out. Um, <clears throat> I had a friend, a fellow I met who was in treatment uh, for drugs and uh, he was trying to deal with the 12th step. I volunteered at, at a treatment center. He was trying to deal with the 12th step, but he had grown up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, so he was raised in an unbelieving scientific family. And uh, <clears throat> he said, I understand all this talk about higher power, but I, you know... I just don't know what to think. I said, I just don't believe in God. 
And I said, I said, do you believe in the Big Bang? He said, yeah. I said, well, let's just go there for a moment. You and I, we're here, we're standing at the Big Bang. Just that moment. I said, okay. I said, what's just before the moment of the Big Bang? He said, I don't know. I said, that's the God we worship. I've come, like St. Paul in Athens, to tell you about the God you don't know. In fact, as Christians, we believe you cannot know God. But as Father Tom Hopko said, you cannot know God, but you have to know him to know that. You know? In Jesus Christ, I know the God who cannot be known because Christ made him known. The only Son is in the bosom of the Father. He alone has seen God. He has declared him. He literally exegeted him. Or in a, in the Ravit, he narrates him in Latin. He narrates him. He speaks him forth to us. The only Son in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. The only God I know is the God I know made known to me in Jesus Christ. As far as all the other gods, you know, I don't believe in a theoretical God. I believe in the God of Jesus Christ who made him known and who became one. But anyway, I've been able to get this guy to, to, to Jesus, but I got him to the Big Bang guy. And, uh, you know, and he made it through his program and he got sober. Uh, and it was a start. And, you know, I pray someday he'll show up at my parish, having found a path. But, you know, trying to disarm people of, of this persecuting God, the God who says, you're in real trouble and I can save you, only to check it out and discover that the trouble you're in is all him. Well, that's kind of, that's like the mafia racket. We're going to offer you protection. From who? From me. <laughs> you pay me money, I break your face, right? So, yeah. this is, I, you know, I don't mean to ridicule these things, but the atheists do. The atheists do. They ridicule it. Because, I mean, and I've upset a few sometimes, and I've said, I don't believe in that God because he's not worthy. He's not worthy. But the God I serve is worthy. That lamb is worthy. That God came to get me out of my trouble that I created. My trouble is I am moving, as the fathers would say, I am moving towards non-being and is causing a lot of trouble in my life. And if it keeps up, it'll keep moving to that, that great kind of semi-world of non-being we call hell. You can't ever really just not be. Annihilation is not a possibility. We are gifted with life. God just says, look, I created you for life. We heard in the Gospel Sunday, more abundantly. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The, uh, the at one moment with God, is a gift into his life. You can live in union with him, in love, not in fear, but in love as he nurtures and feeds us. So it's, you know, I, I write every so often, I, I go out there on the, the legal uh, battle things, and I've, I've been collecting verses, mostly that have been gathered by reform scholars who uh, have a great deal of verses from the fathers that seem to support uh, penal substitution. Um, I had a Canadian reform professor writing me, and he had major great passages from Chrysostom and stuff that way. And it's interesting, so far I have yet to see a single passage from an Eastern father that is purported to be penal substitution that actually is. It's not. It'll have a piece that sounds like this. If they say punishment, they go, aha! You know, but it's not that. It's, it's, so it's sort of a false thing. It's a theory uh, that is used to interpret Scripture. And it is always a collection of verses. Not uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Irenaeus, writing his treatise against the Gnostics, he said that they lacked the kind of the scope of Scripture. They didn't see, they couldn't see the story. You know, what's the flow of this story? Instead, 
they picked this out. And it's sort of interesting, it's like, you know, what's the story of Jesus? Well, one of the better things to see is since he's Christ our Passover, let's go look at the Passover story. There's a flow of the story that the Father said is, can, is a reference. I mean, that's St. Paul says. It's sort of a reference to Christ. Well, what's going on in the story? They're stuck in Egypt. They're slaves. How did they get there? There was a famine. You know, there arose a pharaoh who didn't know them. It wasn't like they volunteered. They were just an accident, kind of. You know, just got in the wrong place, wrong time, and they're enslaved in Egypt. God sends Moses down there to say, you know what? God is really angry with you, and that's why you're here. And I mean, it does, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that in the story. Moses, I mean, you know, God does get angry with them every so often because they're a stiff necked people and all that sort of thing. And, we get that in the story, but the, 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 what's the thrust of the story? The thrust of the story is they were in bondage. I came to get them. I sent Moses. Jesus is our new Moses, the one whom God sends to lead us out. And what does he do? He buries the strong man in the waters of the Red Sea, our baptism. We're baptized, Paul says, they were baptized into Moses, and we are baptized into Christ. But it's this same flow of the story. And so you get the penal substitution and you think, you know, I don't know any stories in the Bible that go like that. Think about that. I don't know a story in the Bible that goes like that. This is not our story. This is Calvin's story. This is Anselm's story. This is somebody else. This is your Sunday school teacher's story that, you know, people who didn't know any better and think that if I don't believe this, I'm not actually a real Christian believer. But it's not the story. You know, in orthodoxy, this is the story. Still Pascha, still singing the same hymns. You pick up and you read a Pascha homily from the second century, Melodio Sardis. And it's like, wow, this would preach now. It's good. You know, and you suddenly discover you're just, you know, I found this when I first got exposed to, to theology reading Russians in, when I was in college. And I couldn't tell because the footnotes weren't good. I couldn't tell when the fa he was quoting the fathers and when he had passed on to his own stuff. It was seamless. I was reading Vladimir Lasky's Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church, and it's just about as dense as the fathers. But, you know, it's just, it was one thing. And I knew this is the real thing. This is the story. This is the faith of the apostles. You know, this is that faith that upholds the universe. And it's not a brand. You know, it's not uh, an argument. This is just the story that we're still telling. We've been going for 2,000 years, almost tonight. Great. Let's see if there's a few more questions. That's okay. Yep. I'll give short answers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. tell you something I think about when I think about the judgment is Jesus' statement in John's gospel where he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the Son of Man be lifted up. The judgment seat of Christ is Christ on the cross. That is his seat. We also use the word seat to describe Christ on the cross. It is his judgment seat. It is his throne. It is his footstool. And so, I mean, you've got to always remember Christianity in an orthodox key is very timey-wimey, uh, you know, it, 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 that uh, he's yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, standing before Christ crucified. This is the judgment seat of God. Um, and, you know, that I take comfort in. You know, we've, we stood there, we, we watched him first on the judgment seat, you know, that day. Now is the judgment of the world. 
now that day he conquers death. Now is that. So I, I think, you know, I've got a lot of differentiation between first judgment, last judgment thing. You know, and I, first off, I think it gets like compartmentalization. You get too many judgments going on. <clears throat> and, you know, um, and as a child, I was raised with sort of the Santa Claus God. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Jesus Christ is coming back and he's mad this time. You know, and that was the way I was taught. You know, like, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm coming back, I'm going to judge you. And I'm thinking, you know, I just, isn't that really odd? You know, it's like, yeah, he was real nice, but he told us, I'm going to come back. And I just think, I think this is another religion. I really do. I think it borders on that. And there are temptations about it. Sometimes we turn what is called hortatory language. That is language that's meant to encourage you to behave yourself and to do well. And then we turn it into the dogma of the church. No, no, no. No, no, no. You know. I mean, you discipline your child. And your child says, Mama hates me. Oops. <laughs> Maybe I went a little too far that time. <laughs> you know, I, I shouldn't have said it that way. You know, that was not the message I meant to say. I meant to say, don't do that. And instead, what they get is they're angry and they don't want to see me anymore. You know, you don't want to do that. God doesn't want us to do that. And God forbid that we who preach should do that. You know, I always remind myself I'm speaking to children when I'm in church. And I've got to be careful what they say. A couple Sundays ago, coming out of service, a little girl walks up to me, a little Romanian girl. She looks up at me. She says, God? Yes. No. <laughs> she had an acorn. And she said, I brought you this. And I said, why, thank you. You know, and I mean, I wish I had something I could have given her back, whatever that way. And you know, the father's standing there apologizing. I said, don't apologize. You know, it's like, this, she shall outgrow this. First time I saw that was with a priest when I was in seminary, and it was a girl in the, in the, who thought he was Jesus. He had a white robe on and stuff, so she thought he was Jesus, had a beard. Um, one day during the sermon, he's out, he's walking and preaching, and she comes up. She looks at him and says, Jesus, and he just picks her up and holds her and keeps going on with the sermon until he's finished and he gives her back to his mom. And he said to me after the service, he said, do you know what that was? I said, well, he said, she will get over and forget that she ever thought I was Jesus. I said, but she'll never get over the fact that Jesus picked her up and held her while he preached. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Um, I mean, I kind of think about our life as Orthodox Christians that we really have nothing, this is Stanley Hauerwas, we have nothing better to do than to have children and teach them about Jesus. And we, we do that. We raise them, we cre we're creating these churches, we're have, filling them with kids and teaching them to love God. I made a, I've got an icon standing in my narthex that's this tall. And it's Jesus and Mary. And the kid, the little ones come in and just love watching them. They, just, they take to it like that. They completely know what they're doing. They love him. They love his mother, and they, they learn that, and they, you know, and they call you God, and they chase each other, and they play with candles, and, you know, um, and it's just scary. I've got, I've, I've turned my altar into a boy shelter for people with ADD issues. Because I tell because it's not just me, it's all of us in here, you know, and it's like lots of little boys have this. And so I tell them, look, guys, you know, you come in here and we'll do our best. We've got our things we've got to do. So thank you, Father. <laughs> thank you all. It's been good being here. Bless you. Thank you, Father Stephen. Uh, I think we were able to record tonight, so I'll try to make that available. Uh, anybody else have a Quick question, anything else before we depart? Okay. Father Marcus, what would be the proper way for us to part? Depart the place. Let's do that one. Okay, y'all please stand. Corruption and you. Corruption and you. Father Marcus does this special. Corruption and you.
bless and keep you as you travel home. Thank you for everything you've done to make this a wonderful event for the parish, for the community. God bless and keep you. If you would, please take your chair next door, and that'll save us some time this evening. Okay. Thank you.